Hi, and welcome to Thor's Day Comics. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, and I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee. You can pre-order the full book of I Am Stan by following the pre-order link in the show notes below. This is the beginning of a new era for Thor. Number 116, the time has come for the trial of the gods. Uh, you know, going by the cover art, this is the first full issue inked by Vince Coletta. Up to this point, Vince Coletta has been uh, wowing audiences and making a name for himself as the inker of Tales of Asgard, uh, bringing, you know, just a really, like a very appropriate, uh, sort of scratchy, otherworldly, olden days kind of style to the Tales of Asgard segments. And now he has graduated with the departure of Chick Stone. He has graduated to uh, the anchor of the main Thor story as well. And he will be uh, for for some time. And it's, it's a, a very auspicious beginning. So uh, we have the trial of the gods, uh, Loki and Thor before Odin. The previous owner of this comic saw fit to apply a border of scotch tape to the front of this comic. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm assuming for some kind of protection or preservation, but as a result, uh, sort of did the opposite. It's um, that that edge is you know sort of browning and crackling faster than any other part of the book. So here's a reiteration of of the artwork from the cover, a slightly different angle. Um, it's nice to have those two angles for comparison. Uh, the cover is a little more illustrative and very beautiful and sensitive. This splash page is a little more direct, uh, a little more confrontational, a little more brutal, uh, a little less illustrative, uh, a little more raw, and um, I find it extremely appealing, uh, the way the characters are staring directly at the reader, um, and, and just some of the stiffness and awkwardness of of the the rendering, just um, I, I find it very compelling. Uh, it, it's it's hard to take your eyes off of this. I, I think we're off to a grand start. And and uh, Vince Coletta is sort of a very controversial figure, uh, about as controversial as as an inker can be. And um, there are a lot of arguments for and against. But what he creates, I, I think, is extremely compelling and uh, very appropriate for Thor. At last, Thor and his evil arch enemy Loki are about to undergo the most dangerous test of all time to determine which of them has lied to Regal Odin, immortal monarch of Asgard. Let the trial begin. Written by Imperial Stan Lee, illustrated by impregnable Jack Kirby, inked by implacable Vince Coletta, lettered by impossible Artie Simic. As usual, Jack Kirby did not just illustrate this comic, he is also the co writer of it. I mean, it's just looking great. This figure in the background, this very um, minimal drawing of the gong. And um, I don't know if pencil photocopies of this exist. Uh, a lot of Jack Kirby's Marvel work, uh, they do have um, photo stats of the pencils. I'd like to do a comparison. But one of the critiques of Vince Coletta is that he erases and eliminates a lot of uh, background detail and rendering that, that Kirby would do in his drawings. And... Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. I want to see every every line of what Kirby laid down. But um, without that knowledge, just sort of looking at the end result, I I am I am transfixed. Who knows what you know a, a faithfully inked version of it would have looked like? But I really like what I'm looking at right now. And again, part of it is the combination of sort of rigor and power, um, and and then also a a like minimalist. Thing going on too. It's it's a, a really nice it's a really nicely balanced uh, comic. It also makes sense, you know. Chick Stone was the ongoing inker uh, for this story, and he had a much more like what you would think of as uh, just like a more sort of you know classically uh, beautiful style of inking. You know, really like fused with with Kirby's aesthetic. Um, I'd also argue that there's there's um, maybe a bit of sameness to it that that you know what the way Jack Kirby's art looks in Thor isn't all that different from how it looks in X-Men or Fantastic Four but with Coletta brought in all of a sudden Thor has its own aesthetic and I like it and it makes sense 
Now, Chickstone left the book. He left uh, to go on to greener pastures. He didn't just want to ink other people's work. He wanted to be in the driver's seat and pencil and ink his own work. So, so he left. And, and so they needed somebody. And so Frank Jacoya filled in in the previous issue. Now Vince Coletta graduates. And this is the perfect issue for uh, story-wise for Coletta to do that because Coletta has, has been establishing the aesthetic of, of the Tales of Asgard backups. And this issue is almost like an extended Tales of Asgard uh, because the, the action carried over from the previous issue uh, now takes place um, almost entirely in Asgard. And it's all this sort of mythic stuff, Trial of the Gods. And so I, I imagine this was a very important comic for Walt Simonson. Uh, I know he likes to delve headfirst into the, the, the um, you know, Norse mythology aspects of the Thor comic. And, and, and I'm right there with him. And um, this kind of reminds me a little bit of, of the earliest issues of... Uh, Walt Simonson's, you know, famous uh, second Thor run, the, the Thor run that he did in the 80s that he wrote Andrew, uh, where there's a dispute going on. Uh, this time it's, it's, it's Loki and Thor. In uh, Simonson's, it was Thor and Beta Ray Bill. And to resolve it, Odin sends them to some corner of Asgard where they have to, you know, fight it out and, and, and settle their differences. So um, we're, getting, we're getting the extended soap opera, previous issue, uh, Thor and Loki both had two conflicting stories that they were telling, uh, telling Odin about why, uh, Jane Foster is there. And so the only way to decide it is with a trial of the gods. Odin sends them out. Uh, you can, you can have no weapons. You have to rely only on your, uh, your own natural strength. And so Thor has to surrender his hammer and then they get sent to Skornheim, this, uh, you know, dangerous uh, kingdom within, you know, the larger, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it Asgard, the larger, like, mythic space uh, of, uh, you know, the, the Norse gods. And they they have to race to a dimensional gate that is, uh, you know, what they would have called the matter threshold in uh, in the new gods. Uh, they have to, to race to a dimensional gate that is going to take them back to Asgard, the, the, the city of Asgard. And whoever gets there first wins the trial of the gods. But turns out Loki's cheating. He has a bag of magical Norn stones, each one having, you know, different magical powers that he can employ. And Thor says, hey, no fair. Odin said no weapons. And Loki's like, well, this isn't a weapon. Uh, you know, you know, gaming the system, even though, yes, they're not specifically weapons. And he doesn't use them to do direct harm to Thor. But when Odin said... Uh, no weapons, and then clarified with rely on your own natural strength. I think this is exactly this the sort of thing he he uh, would would not allow had he known. But but Loki is a tricky guy. He he keeps this stuff secret. And my recollection of this story was that it it takes place entirely in Asgardian myth space. But no part of the balance of Thor, at least at this point, is that he's got his you know far far away adventures. But then. You know, Earth is always an important part of the equation. And so we do get some glimpses of Earth via Loki's Norn Stones. Uh, he shows Thor what's going on on Earth with Jane Foster and that Loki has sent, uh, again, more, you know, references to previous continuity. He he has sent his his allies, uh, uh, the, the Enchantress and the Executioner, to kidnap Jane Foster in an attempt as, as sort of like a psychological warfare against Thor to keep Thor so um, occupied with worrying about Jane Foster that he won't be able to uh, perform at his, at his peak level in this trial of the gods. So, I mean, just really, you know, great writing, great storytelling. This, uh, you know, so far this is my favorite of, of the issues we've read. Uh, this, this is just my kind of, th I love this stuff. You know, give me more, as much Asgardian action as possible. And so they start out, uh, Skornheim is just this incredibly dangerous uh, place almost seemingly designed uh, to you know to hurt you to be a you know like like a series of trials that you have to go through and so um, there's this lava section and and Loki hardens it uh, for himself so he can run but but Thor gets caught up in it so so Loki gets ahead because he should be struggling through there too but because of his Norn stones he's not uh, Thor eventually breaks free Loki makes his way to this sort of you know spiky area and he. Uh, has a stone that makes him immaterial. 
Thor does not have such a thing, but he uh, puts together a little a little tool by wrapping his his cape around his helmet, and he can sort of like bash his way through the spikes. It's not fast, it's not easy, but it gets the job done. Still, Loki, uh, even with all that, Loki's only a little bit ahead of him. Uh, Thor punches him, threatens him, and then implores him to call off uh, the Enchantress and the Executioner. Loki refuses, and then they both get zapped by this uh, super cool uh, character uh, wearing sort of like half, uh, you know, Norse mythology kind of, you know, furry, you know, boots and 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 armor, and and then half, uh, you know, Roman gladiator. Really, really nice aesthetic. That really cool. I like the aesthetics of of uh, Roman gladiator armor. Meanwhile, back home, uh, Odin's taking a bath, and and Balder, you know, always uh, sort of. Thor's advocate in Asgard says that, you know, while, you know, sort of randomly looking at Earth, he saw that the Enchantress and Executioner are have tried to kidnap uh, uh, Jane Foster. And, and he thinks, you know, it must, must be some ploy by Loki to, to keep Thor distracted. Uh, I love every time we see sort of, you know, the, the view screens that Odin uses to, to look at things, they, they always look different. This one, really nice design. You know, furry... Uh, bathrobe outfit, you know, just uh, this this uh, bathtub, just constant invention, just you know, just a really great comic. Uh, and so he sends Balder off to make sure no harm comes to Jane Foster. And then we get this really nice, like two thirds splash uh, of another shot of of that gladiator, and and showing the scale, showing that yeah, he is in fact a giant. And when he puts his two electrode claws together, uh, they shoot this blast of electricity. Thor is dodging and, and weaving. Uh, he's got Thor in his sights. Thor continues to dodge. He grabs a, a piece of rock, throws it, uh, hits the um, the gladiator Yag, uh, the giant gladiator Yag, hits him in the head. Then reaching out with fingers like steel vices, mighty Thor rips off a fragment of petrified rock and hurls it straight and true with the force of a comet, felling the giant Yag even as David felled Goliath many ages before. Yag shall slay no more. And, you know, uh, David versus Goliath uh, is an ongoing motif in Kirby's comics and, and a very appealing motif, this idea of, of sort of a, a hero who's in over his head against a, an enemy that, like, you know, way outclasses him, uh, way outpowers him, yet with smarts and determination and, 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 and strength of will uh, is able to defeat it. It's a very, very satisfying uh, story setup, and Kirby employs it again and again. And, and it's it's working here for sure. He uh, knocks down the giant, continues. We got 10 years to go before the invention of Dungeons and Dragons. So you get kind of like, it's 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 a comic, it's a story you're reading, but you're it's also kind of like a game and, and you're sort of uh, playing along with Thor and, and trying to think, you know, oh, how's he gonna get past this obstacle? It's it's even even more time before we start getting to, to like, uh, you know, action adventure video games. Uh, you know, something like uh, Legend of Zelda or, or uh, you know, th things of that ilk. And we're getting that, 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 that itch is being scratched here. So now uh, Loki's in this area of, of um, you know, intense heat. He creates uh, like a mystic shield again with a Norn stone. And then he gets to this really cool looking uh, forest of uh, carnivorous plants. Super freaky, super crazy looking you know, what's this buzzsaw thing over there? And, and, and look, at, look at that face. And again, you know, this, you know, Kirby drew all this stuff. He came up with all this stuff. And I'm sure it looks amazing in his pencils. But there's something about Vinny's ink line, the sort of uh, choppy aspect of it and the sort of, um, you know, awkwardness of it that make this little scene like extra disturbing. Like that face and this like, I don't know, you, you know, the one tooth on this thing. Really great. Like, like I could see how at this point, you know, Stan as editor is kind of like, oh, Col Colette is the guy for the job. This, this is really working. And, and now we cut from Asgard where like the, the Coletta stuff is like just working, you know, 110%. Then you get to earth and it's like, okay, how's Coletta's stuff work on earth? And again, it's, it's not quite the perfect fit that it is with the Asgard stuff, but still, this is like a different look. Like, you know, I'd argue that like a, a Giacoya or a Chick Stone is, is a more natural fit for this sort of modern day kind of stuff. But the Coletta inks, 
it kind of looks like nothing else. And, and it, it really has, you know, some, some graphic punch that, that I'm really enjoying. And, and maybe because it's not an exact perfect fit, it's a little more uh, idiosyncratic. And, and then also the choice, and as far as I understand, this is an inker's choice, to leave the borders open on these two pages really works nicely too. Like, like if that was Vinny's call, that's, that's a good call there. This, this page is, is really, really nice, really working for me. So yeah, we're in sort of regular Marvel land now. We're not, we're not in uh, specifically Asgard anymore. And so crossovers galore. We got uh, the Teen Brigade who we've seen in sort of um, Hulk issues and Avengers issues. They, they're, they're seeing all this craziness going on. Uh, and then the Avengers get contacted. And then, uh, you know, word goes out. They try to get in touch with Daredevil. I mean, how's this for an odd cameo? You know, this this new character, Daredevil, showing up in Thor. Uh, I'm assuming inked by inked by Coletta. Sometimes uh, Stan would have Wally Wood ink Daredevil in his various appearances in other books. This looks to me like Coletta. I mean, may, may, maybe Coletta with a little wood touch-up or something. I don't know, but it, it doesn't, like... I kind of like seeing this kind of not quite right version of of Daredevil. Really cool. And so Daredevil's like, I don't have time for this. I gotta go fight Submariner. And so I mean, you know, a little a little tie-in to sort of this like classic issue that's been reprinted a million times, the sort of Wally Wood uh Daredevil versus Submariner. See Daredevil number seven. So again, we're getting all these plugs. And then now Fantastic Four, sort of showing you what's going on in the larger Marvel universe. Here's a glimpse here, too. Uh the sort of new Avengers lineup with Captain America as leader. And so now the Frightful Four show up, and this is, you know, see Fantastic Four number 38. This is taking place right after the Frightful Four nuked uh, the Fantastic Four. And, and so now they're going to the Baxter building. They're going to take it over, but they're like not sure if the Fantastic Four survived the bomb they dropped. Now, they don't spell it out here, but it was a nuclear bomb they dropped in that issue. So interesting that they're still not sure. But then they see some flames from above, uh, you know, and they're like, oh, shit, it's the Human Torch. Let's get out of here. So the Baxter building is saved, but it is not the Human Torch. It is Balder. Again, uh, showing up, really cool rendering here, really cool hatching. it. And again, I don't think this would have been part of the standard bag of tricks for inking Kirby at this point. And I like it. I like, I like this weirdness. And Balder, I think for the first time, assumes sort of like a Clark Kent version of Balder, which all, all the Asgardians seem to have. You know, Odin's done it. Loki's done it. Now we get to see Balder as this sort of, um, you know, Darren McGavin uh, private investigator look. And, you know, they're still menacing Jane Foster. Thor's going through that, you know, that area of intense heat, which Loki just sort of skipped over, and it's tough, but he makes it. Now Thor gets to the end of it, and now he's got to make his way through the carnivorous plants. Again, he's doing things the hard way. He's doing the things the way you're supposed to do, and he's kicking all kinds of ass. It's not easy, and he's kicking all kinds of ass. And then Loki, that snake, is just sort of, you know, cheating his way through all of it and breezing through all of it. Uh, Thor jumps in the water. He's swimming. This is just some great fantasy action adventure art. And now he's made his way uh, close to the end. He sees Loki uh, right at the chasm that they have to jump across to get to their goal. And he grabs on to Loki. Uh, but Thor is just so weakened from this arduous uh, adventure he's been on that, that Loki's able. And Loki's still, you know, fresh as a daisy. He hasn't had to do any anything difficult yet. Uh, you know, he punches Thor and, you know, it gives him just enough time to, to leap into that that dimensional barrier, uh, you know, just seconds before Thor. So the trial of the gods is over. Despite my every effort, he beat me. Loki with his Norn stones, his cunning, his deceit, Loki has won. So we got this ongoing soap opera begun two issues ago, and it's still not resolved. Uh, we got, you know, this feels like a complete issue, a complete story, a complete sort of arc, but we got to find out you know, what, what, what happens now when they show up in Asgard? What, what's, what's Odin going to say about all this? What's, you know, you know what's going to happen? The, the, the ongoing soap opera of Thor and, and sort of, you know, one of the elements we associate with Marvel and, and, and what we look for from a Marvel comic and enjoy in a Marvel comic, it's happening here. And so we got a tease for, again, 
uh, you know, pushing Daredevil, this, this, you know, sort of the newest character uh, in, in the Marvel lineup, pushing uh, him a little um, crossover in the Fantastic Four, uh, right after the Fantastic Four have lost their powers in that, uh, um, in issue 38. Now we got issue 39. Uh, we got, you know, the continuing uh, flashback story of, of uh, Captain America with the Red Skull. Got uh, X-Men over here. W one of Kirby's uh, most uh, be beautiful and rigorous covers he's ever drawn there. And now we have a great little Tales of Asgard. Story, Stan Lee, penciling Jack Kirby, inking Vince Coletta, lettering Artie Simic. Of course, Jack Kirby's co-writer on this, uh, you know, uh, most likely the, the, dominant, the dominant writer, the dominant uh, driving force of this story, the challenge. And so Loki's, uh, you know, we've established that Loki's just a great big backstabber looking to, even though he and Thor are ostensibly friends and allies and brothers, uh, he's looking for every opportunity to backstab uh, Thor and trip him up. Uh, and we saw, you know, what that relationship has grown into in the present. And now we're seeing, you know, the beginnings of that in Tales of Asgard. Amazing costume design here, this sort of dragon-headed staff. And again, this is, this is where, you know, Coletta was getting his start on the Thor books. And, and, you know, he's right at home here. He made his jump to the big time and I think hit a home run. And, and now here he is back in his comfort zone. Uh, Loki makes this deal. Man, just can't, can't take my eyes off this costume. Loki makes this backroom deal. Thor is talking to King Hymir's sister. Uh, and um, so they're, they're sort of plotting Thor's downfall together. Hymir offers a challenge, you know, hey, it worked in the main story. Let's do it here, a, ch a challenge of the gods. And that here's the stakes. If Thor loses, uh, he'll find himself in a life of slavery to King Hymir. But uh, Thor can't back down from a challenge and he knows he'll overcome whatever comes his way. They're on this you know, cool looking boat all dressed in these, uh, you know, cool looking uh, hooded uh, uh, fishing outfits. They, uh, they, you know, it's not any ordinary fishing trip. It's an Asgardian fishing trip. He's got to fight this giant sea monster, you know, Kirby, Kirby and his sea monsters. Uh, you know, nobody draws them better. Uh, and, you know, uh, we see him in like the old monster comics that he was doing prior to this. And then uh, we see them in, you know, we saw like Spawn in uh, New God's number six, number five and six. And so, uh, you know, he throws his hammer and again, great panel. Like, and I know Kirby's the architect of this, this image and that Vinny, for all I know, could be eliminating details and here and stuff. But I, I think the chemistry between the two of them, the rough, the scratchiness of this, the way it really does like dissolve into nothing right here. I think it's great. I think it's beautiful. And I don't, I don't know that it would, I mean, it, it would, quite be exactly this uh, inked by anybody else. Now Thor has overcome that challenge. He's ready for the final challenge, which seems easy enough. He has to destroy this goblet. And uh, Thor's like, well, that's that seems easy enough. Loki's uh, kind of distracting him with it, to, trying to like eat up the, the two minutes he has to destroy this, uh, this two minute time limit he has to destroy this goblet. But he he smells a rat, he throws it and it's it's enchanted. It's it's powerful and he hits it with his hammer and it's impervious to his hammer which can you know destroy mountains as he says and then uh princess rinda who sort of you know we saw that you know there was sort of something between her and thor at the beginning of the issue she's like uh like ariadne in theseus i think that was her name the the daughter of um king minos uh, she you know gives thor a little hint uh about what he needs to do to to, to be victorious and so he she doesn't quite spell it out. And I wonder if in like, in uh, uh, Kirby's margin notes, if she does spell it out, if she does tell him like, hey, throw it at his helmet and, and it'll be destroyed. I don't know if, but, but what we end up in the, in the verbiage here is not that, just her sort of begging him not to kill her brother because that, you know, that would be the only way for Thor to get out of this challenge is to, to, to kill him because he's not, you know, he can't break this goblet. Sort of gets him thinking that, oh, maybe that's some kind of hint he throws the goblet at the king uh, with killing speed. It hits his helmet and, and is destroyed. And that that was the key. His, his magic helmet was the sort of, uh, you, know, had, you know, the source of the enchantment on this. And so if he throws it at that, it's destroyed. And, and, and the king is kind of thinking to himself, wow, you know, he hit me so hard. If my, ha if my helmet wasn't magic, I'd be dead. And Thor's victorious. He marches off. Uh, uh, king Hemir blames Loki, thinks Loki... You know, if Loki was going to rat out his own brother, 
why wouldn't he rat him out? He, he smells a rat, punches Loki, and he's, he's kind of right. Uh, this isn't going to deter Loki. I'll, I shall never stop scheming. Many are the sinister schemes of Loki, and many are the spectacular tales which await you on these pages in the months to come. So till we are once again summoned to the Imperial realm, may the eyes of Asgard be ever upon thee. So um, great story just across the board, uh, you know, making all the sort of mythic stuff take center stage uh, in this issue is is just a great idea. You got this nice little uh, Tales of Asgard in the back too as a bonus, but it's great. And and you know, Vinnie Coletta's looking great on that on that main issue. Uh, you know, gi- giving the the comic maybe like a little bit of a boost even that that uh, just this new aesthetic. Now, Thor is a comic from Jack Kirby, who's drawing like many of the comics in the Marvel line to begin with, and. We found a way through an idiosyncratic inker, we found a way to give it a completely different aesthetic, you know, make it sort of stand out and not be so sort of same, samey, samey with the, the rest of the line. So um, can't wait to see where this goes. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, and I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee. Uh, both those books are available for pre-order if you follow the pre-order link in the show notes below. I'll see you next time for Thursday Comics.